Good evening, everyone. Hello out there. I have to experiment, okay? Let's see what happens here. So sit down on the couch. Oh, man. I knew that would probably get a reaction. Welcome to the First Baptist Church of Gibsonton, Florida. So glad you're here. I know the weather outside has been kind of wet. And then it quit raining for a little while and be nice, and then it rained again. But we needed the rain, and God knows what's going on. And uh, especially in my neighborhood up there, uh, we needed a lot of water. So thank you, Lord, for that. Just remain seated for this song, but those in the sanctuary, let's all sing together. And those on the other side of the camera, if you're not driving, you can sing along with us. Uh, well, actually, you can sing while you're driving, but don't open your book up <laughs> if you're driving. Be careful, uh, others are coming in. Let's just sing together. The words and notes are on 447, and the words will be on the screen. Lily of the Valley, let's do verses one and two, please. Amen. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The Lily of the Valley, alone I see all I need to cleanse and make me fully whole in sorrow he's my comfort in trouble he's my stay he tells me every care on him to roll he's a lily of the valley the bright and morning star he's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul he all my grief has taken and all our sorrows bore. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken and all my idols torn. From my heart and now he keeps me by his power. Oh, all the world forsake me and Satan tempt me sore. Through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Hey, Amen. Uh, somebody told me we had about 30 visitors tonight. One, two, three. Yeah, there's about 30 visitors visiting the church tonight. We're glad you're here. Maybe not anyone for the first time. But uh, we can understand that maybe this evening. But it's good to see just about every service someone that hadn't been here before. And I think that's exciting. So it's kind of a downer when they're not. But praise the Lord. There comes a visitor. <laughs> One of our good faithful men did just walk in. I just uh, harassed him a little bit. I missed saying anything about it this morning. But on the uh, table out front in the foyer... Sister Evie had made some little uh, Valentine things for visitors. And for, I think there's a few left if you want a souvenir out there. And thanks, Sister Evie, if you're watching. Thank you for doing that. And I apologize to you for missing that. Very thoughtful lady. And a good singer, too. And I don't know if I still have mine in my pocket or not, but Brother David and some of the staff have put together a little card here. You probably can't see it on the camera. But it has the how to get the website and how to get to live streaming. It has the numbers and everything on there for you uh, if you have trouble doing that. And uh, there's some sample cards back there uh, close to where Paul sits if you need those on your way out. Or if you want to share that with somebody else, that's a good little witnessing tool. It actually has a scripture on the back that you're welcome to use. Uh, any other announcements, pastors, that I've missed? Wednesday night service, yes. 7 o'clock, right here in the sanctuary. Bible study, we sing some, we have prayer, uh, testimonies. We just have a real good spiritual evening on Sunday, uh, Wednesday evening. So you be here with us and bring somebody else with you. Okay, end of that session of announcements. Uh, that meeting is adjourned. Let's go to a prayer meeting. Father, thank you for loving us and for drawing us together. And we do thank you for the weather you've given us, uh, refreshing water. And uh, 
Thank you for each person present in the service this evening. Thank you for all those who are watching and listening by means of video and airwaves. Thank you for loving us, Father. Thank you for giving us everything that you had, including your own life, that we may have eternal life with you. Jesus' powerful name we do pray, amen. Now as we sing together, let's stand on this one. The notes are on number 450-450. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Let's sing two verses. And uh, if ushers will, we'll use this as our uh, offertory hand. And thanks to this orchestra again for the good music all day. Fantastic. There will never be a sweeter story, story of the Savior's love divine, love that brought him from the realms of glory, just to save a sinful soul like mine. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Oh, is the love of Jesus something wonderful, wonderful it is to me. Boundless as the universe around me, reaching to the furthest soul away, saving, keeping love it was that found me. That is why my heart can truly say, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful, wonderful it is to me? Amen. Lord, thank you for finances that you give us. Thank you for this time of allowing us to give back through obedience and through love to share with others. Pray in your holy name again, Father. Thank you for loving us. Amen and amen. amen. Following the offering, Brother David has some special music for us, and then we'll proceed from there. Pray as this orchestra plays for the offertory. Thank you again, orchestra. Brother David Howard, a multi-talented young man. He, he even knows how to start the computers. <laughs> he knows how to take care of <laughs> He knows how to do that. We're praying for you, David. He's going to the piano, so let me get out of the way. If I may, I wanted to share with you some exciting news from our technology department. Uh, we've been working on our church website at 1stbaptistgibsonton.com. Uh, we've added under resources the church bulletin. Uh, usually you can see it uh, maybe a day or two before you get the bulletin. Uh, we also have uh, on the main toolbar at the top of the page uh, from the pastor and you can read the message that the pastor writes weekly uh, for us so we're excited about that but the newest thing that we have going on it's not quite ready but it is there uh, I've worked with Kingdom Services we've created a prayer blog page and the idea is uh, similar to Facebook. You can go in, write your prayer requests, uh, pray for me, pray for whatever, and then when somebody else sees it, they can respond back, I'm praying for you, put a little heart emoji there. 
Our admins uh, will gladly uh, approve it so that it can be seen by everybody. So a good encouraging tool uh, and a wonderful place and I encourage people to bring them to our website. We have a lot to see and uh, I think it'll be a blessing to them as well. This song needs no introduction. It's always on my heart, especially today because of the message Brother Mac preached. Jesus loves you. Would you sing it with us? Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Amen. Thank you, Brother David, and. Uh, all the orchestra again, thank you. I brought some notes. I've been asked to introduce our speaker for the evening, and I couldn't get all of the stuff in here. So let me simplify it and introduce seriously our speaker for the evening. Brother Buddy Burton. We're so blessed to have Buddy. Thank you. God bless you. Praying for you, Bud. And we will uh, bypass some of the church regulations. I think we might let him use the stool for a few minutes. Tonight only for a few minutes. A few minutes. I want to emphasize that. A few minutes. All right. A few minutes. Oh, he's got a lot of pages there, too. Yeah. Look out. Max said, uh, am I on? Yes. Max said that uh, if Pat were here, she'd say, no sitting down on the job. <laughs> I've done something to my hip. I don't know what. But uh, <laughs> there's, there, <laughs> but anyhow, there are a lot of folks that are sick today, and you know that. More, more so probably than ever before in history. Statistics tell us that the big majority of illnesses are psychosomatic. That's a big word meaning 
that they stem from worry, tension, fear, bitterness, and all those type things. Uh, that'll make you sick. I'm convinced it'll kill you um, if you let it go on and on and on. Now, if you and I went to the doctor, which I'm fixing to do tomorrow, what would happen if you go in there and you're sick? He would give you a prescription, wouldn't he? And uh, hopefully, if, if, if it was the right kind of medicine, if you took that um, as directed, then you'd get relief. But if you fail to use it like it's told you to use it, if it says to use it three times a day, you'd need to do that. But say you'd skip a day or skip one, well, it's not going to help you, is it? You know with these things they give you for uh, like z pack you know, they make sure and tell you, take it till it's gone. So tonight, I'm going to be Dr. Burton. And I'm going to give you a prescription that will definitely make us better. This prescription is called the 23rd Psalm. If we want to change our spiritual lives, we can take this prescription and pay attention to it and it can make a difference in our lives. It wasn't original with me, this prescription idea. And the person that it was original with said, if you use this prescription five times a day for seven days, see if there's not a difference. Definite change in your life. It's not to be a quick, hurried reading of the psalm. You probably have it memorized, the 23rd Psalm. Rather read it prayerfully, carefully, and meditate on it like you would a love letter from your sweetheart, William. There's a story of this guy that was in the service, and for two years he sent his wife a love letter every day. When he got home, he found out she'd married the postman. <laughs> so this is going to be a God's love letter to us to help us. It sounds simple. But it's not. This is one of the most powerful writings in existence today, the 23rd Psalm. Amen. It's been tried and proven in people's lives, and it'll work for you and me. This isn't all for tonight. I'll be through by 10. <laughs> Ralph Waldo Emerson said this, A man is what he thinks about all day long. Marcus Aurelius wrote this, A man's life is what his thoughts make it. Vince, Norman Vincent Peale said, change your thoughts and you change your world. The Bible says, as a man or a woman thinketh in his heart, what? So is he. You're not what you think you are, you're what you think about. Just like we are what we eat. So it's to be, it's to be studied carefully and, and do this carefully and it will help us. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Um, is a, I guess that's part of Brother Linville's life, Romans 12, 1 and 2. But not to be conformed to this world. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. That does not mean lipstick and earrings and trying to look nice and smell nice. It's not talking about being conformed to those things. It's the thought of this world we're living in, the thought processes. And renew our minds that we may prove what's that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. A new way of thinking. And this can help us if we'll do it. We assume that David wrote this psalm. A man who failed God miserably but repented. And he was able, as the Apostle Paul told us, an Apostle Paul's secret to forget the past. You know, when Paul said, I die daily, he didn't mean it's a morbid, miserable thing that you got to do. Paul said he saw, he, he was holding Stephen's cloak while they stoned him to death. He burned churches. Uh, he did all these evil things. And Paul said, I've got to die daily to those things or it'll drive me nuts. You know, because people and the devil will bring up your past. But Paul said, I've only got one thing to tell you that'll help you. And that's forget the past, put it behind you. And David was able to do this. 
He was a man that failed miserably, but look what God did with him. So let's take a look at this psalm tonight in depth, and I think it'll help us in our lives. After World War II, the Allied forces, there were hundreds of kids that were victims of the war, orphans. They were scared to death. You know, you can imagine what they went through, and here they had them to try and help them. And these kids would worry all night, not sleep good. So here's a secret that they found out. After the kids had eaten supper and whatever the activities were for the night, they'd give each one of those children a slice of bread to hold in their hand. And they would sleep peacefully because they knew the next day they'd have something to eat, which they'd gone with forever. In this psalm, David points out something of the same feeling of the sheep when the Lord said, uh, the Lord is my, he said this, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The sheep instinctively know that the shepherd has made plans for them tomorrow, just like they did for those children. And we know that. What a wonderful God we serve. Um, he's made plans for their grazing. He made plans for them today. So the sheep says, well, he'll prepare, for, he'll prepare and, and do it for us to mother, tomorrow. The sheep can rest well knowing that the sheep shepherd will provide for them. Now you notice in this psalm, David doesn't begin by asking for something. Rather, he just presents a statement, a fact. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. God knows our needs before we ask. And the greatest source of our worry, folks, is mostly over tomorrow. Think about this. The women that were going to the tomb that first Easter morning, they missed the beauty of that first Easter morning. They missed the beauty of the gardens and the flowers. Why? Because they were worried about who would roll the stone away from their dead Savior and friend. When they arrived, what did they find out? The stone was rolled away. God took care of that. And our stones will be rolled away like that. Futile worry. Studies prove that the majority of what we worry about never comes to pass. David said this, he'd never seen the righteous forsaken. Now that's in his time, folks. They're being forsaken today. There are people being killed, martyred, and starved to death that believe God and live for Him. But in David's time, he said that, and that was a good thing for him to see. I like the way the little girl misquoted this. The Lord is my shepherd, that's all I want. You know, that's pretty good, isn't it? That's all I want. Next he says, he, let's say that together. The first line, ready? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The next one, let's say it together. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. That's the all for right now. We'll do that. About 9 o'clock we'll get to that one. I was working for a crazy preacher. And uh, I was the headmaster of the school and we did the music and all those kind of things. I had uh, my kids and my family situation. And so one morning I came to school and everybody started saying, boy, you look bad. And Janet will tell you, I never look bad. I, mean, I never have since I was born. Anyhow, you know, after people tell you that a while, what will you begin to think? You begin to think, boy, I, there must be something wrong with me. So I went to the doctor. He pulled my eye back like that, and he said, you've lost most of the blood in your body. And so stress, worry, different situations had gotten the best of me. And he said, if you will do what I ask you to do, I'll let you leave the hospital. If you'll go somewhere where you can be without that family and without this nut that you work with, he said, I'll let you go if you'll take time. So I did that. The sheep start grazing at 4 a.m. and they walk steadily. They're never still until 10 a.m. They're very hot, very thirsty, and the shepherd knows that they can't drink water while they're hot and full of undigested grass. So he makes them lie down and cool off. 
and chew their cud. Then he lets them drink. You know, folks who've made an impact on life and on our lives are those who've taken time apart. Poems and songs are not usually written among the noisy, congested crowds. Elijah found God not in an earthquake, but in a still, small voice. Moses saw a simple burning bush. Saul was on a lonely, quiet road when he saw his heavenly vision. Jesus take, took time alone. Now, he's the Son of God, and uh, if he needed that, how much more do we need it? But you can read about it, how he would take time alone and get away from the crowd, sometimes to get away from his disciples, like uh, Mac has to do getting away from his staff in order for to survive, don't you? <laughs> this is difficult for us to do, folks. You know, we've been taught to work for the night is coming. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Go, 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 go. We've been taught that. But before the disciples went out to conquer the world, what did they do? They tarried in prayer till the power came, the Holy Spirit. Sometimes, like that situation I told you about with me, we have to be on our backs to look up. Many times we're forced, not by God, but by our own foolishness or circumstances to lie down and, and think things through. It can be the most blessed time of our spiritual lives. In my case, it was a wonderful time. He's probably about ready to lay me down again. But if we accept it in the right way, folks, remember this, and I love this. I don't know where I heard it. After every Calvary, there's an Easter morning. Isn't that good? After every Calvary. You know the cross. I've heard people say, well, my husband's an alcoholic. That's my cross to bear. You know, or my mother-in-law, or first one thing and then the other. The cross has never been anything but to die on. Now, you may have a burden with somebody or some situation, but it's not a cross to bear. You know, the cross has never been anything but to die on. But let's go ahead to the next one. Let's say it together. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Now, the sheep fear water. They have a heavy coat. They're poor swimmers. They won't drink from a moving stream, only from still water. Now, listen, the shepherd doesn't ridicule his sheep for fear. Think about that a minute. He doesn't ridicule them because they have that fear. But what he'll do, he'll watch constantly for still waters. If he finds none, he takes stones and fashions a dam and forms a pool where his sheep can drink without fear. I've never heard it or seen it counted on myself, but I've heard it said several times that there's 365 times in the Bible that says don't fear. You know, one for every day. That ought to be enough for us, hasn't it? Now listen, God knows our weaknesses and our limitations. He created us. You know, sometimes when I'm talking to him, I said, hey, I didn't ask to be born. I mean, here I am. Name me Ora Echo. What would you, I mean, what are you going to do in life? But I said, you ought to know me because we believe you created us, so you know me, so you've got to help me in these situations. The Bible says his strength is made perfect when? In our weakness. Think about that. Isn't that awesome? God doesn't force us where we're unable to go. Instead, he's constantly ministering to us by our, to, to our needs. And he does that through um, our own Bible study and prayer and coming just like this, Sunday school, all the things that we do help us to be ministered to for our needs. He understands our burdens. I've never been much on preaching about eschatology. Somebody said, are you pre-millennial or post-millennial? I'm pan-millennialist. Everything's going to pan out all right. <laughs> now, there's times for that. But you know, I don't take it for granted that I get to spend time speaking to you and sharing with you folks. And if I can't share something that's not going to help me or you, I don't want to do it. You know, I'd rather you watch TV and just enjoy the evening, you know, doing something else. But if, if it doesn't help us, that's what's so great about uh, Brother Mac's sermons. You know, they're timely. 
you know, and, and what we're, where we're living today. So he understands our burdens, and just as a sheep can rest knowing that the shepherd is meeting their needs, so can we. The Bible says, He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. Behold, that he that keepeth thee will not slumber. He that keepeth Israel, which are us, shall neither slumber or sleep. Isn't that comforting to know that? You know, when you do this and you, and you begin to dwell on this scripture like we're talking about tonight, you know, in your quiet time, picture a stream or a river and then think about him leading us beside still waters. It'll be a restful experience for us. Martin Luther wrote a great song. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. The next one, he restoreth my soul. Let's say it. He restoreth my soul. Think about that. We don't have to do that. Many things we have to do. But he restores our soul. Someone wrote a letter one time, life ended for me. Somewhere during these past years, through a slow process, it took years to stifle my faith, but now it's entirely gone. I'm only a shell of a person. Just think about that. If only the person that wrote that know, knew that God restores his soul and he had hope. Sheep start out grazing. They find a definite place in line and stay there all day. Except sometimes during the day, they trot over to the shepherd. He rubs their head, scratches behind their ears, and reassures them. Then they go back to their place in line. David remembers how close he was to God one time. He defeated Goliath, didn't he? Successful as a king. But then he became self-sufficient. We can get that way, can't we? Didn't need the power of God, he didn't think. Lost his nearness to God. And as we know, he fell into sin. And things went bad for him. Burdens of guilt got heavy. And then one of the most beautiful psalms you can read is where he repented, and that's Psalms 51. That's a great psalm to study. The mind, he became a new person, restored by the shepherd. The mind is like the body. It can be wounded. Listen to this. When I violate my standards, I wound my mind. And some wounds have a hard time of being healed. And they don't heal by themselves. And they need the one that restores us to come and restore us. Moffat reads this this particular statement like this, he revives life in me. Isn't that good? He restores me. He revives life in me. We run down like a clock. We can lose our drive and our push in life, less willing to, dis, you know, to, to attempt the, the, the impossible and difficult. And like squeezing the uh, uh, pulp out of an orange and the juice, all that's left is just the useless pulp and the, and the skin of the orange. Life can squeeze the spirit out of a person. You may have experienced it. You may know somebody that has. And a person becomes only a shell. We feel no more thrill of enthusiasm. The dawning of a new day leaves us cold and hopeless. In the beginning, the Word says that He breathed into man what? The breath of life, and man became a living soul. God has the power, listen to this, and willingness to again breathe into us afresh and anew the breath of life. Isn't that wonderful? Now listen, the psychiatrist's couch can never replace the church in solving the problems of a frustrated society. Now, I think there's some validity to some counseling. Um... You know, I'm not a real uh, big advocate of it because I've, I've got 66 hours in it. I've got my degree in counseling, and I've done a lot of it, and I learned a lot of things. One thing I learned is they're not going to do anything you suggest to them. Did you hear me? You can look them right in the eye 
and say, if you walk out on that railroad track, a train's going to run over you. And they'll break their neck getting out there. You know, a lot of, you know, and they don't listen to it. And it's a dangerous thing. That's why, you know, here we don't do a lot, especially with women. Now, Janet and I were on a trip to Colorado one time, and this woman wanted to counsel with me. And I kindly wanted to. She was pretty. <laughs> but anyhow, Janet didn't like that idea. So I said this to her, and I've learned to use it all these years. My wife and I will be glad to sit down and talk with you. Generally, that'll end the desire to counsel with you. So, um, you know, I think that there are some validity to it, but, you know, Brother Max, like my daddy, my daddy would say, if you want some counseling, come Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, and listen to what I preach. God's Word, and you got all the counseling you need. People want somebody to agree with them. Now, I took the Rogerian method of counseling. You know what that's like? They'll say something to you, and you'll say, you feel that very deeply, don't you? <laughs> and then you say, what do you think you ought to do about it? You know? And then they're just as happy as a lark. But this one, the, I use it, I've used it my whole ministry. Years ago, they had the mental health center. I don't know what they got now. But in Gadsden, Alabama, they called it the mental health center. This woman came in one day and slammed $85 and screamed on the desk. And she said, I want somebody to listen to me. That's what people want. Well, we're talking about somebody that'll listen to you. He's got the best counsel you'll find of anybody. You know. And so that's, that's, that's what that's about. Let's, let's say this next one. Ready? He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That's the one we're going to think about right now. There's a plaque at the Bach Tower, the Singing Tower. Have you ever been over there? Beautiful place. There's a, there's a plaque there that reads this. I come here to find myself. It's so easy to get lost in the world. Isn't that the truth? To get lost in the world. We come to the forks in the road of life and can't decide which way to go. Decisions got to be made. We all go through that all the time. And we've got to have guidance. Well, the paths of righteousness mean in the right paths. That's how he leads us, in the right way. There's a way that seemeth right to man, but what? Yeah, in the end of it, it's destruction. So we don't want to trust that, do we? He's the one that will lead us in the right ones. David remembers that the sheep have no sense of direction. They're dumb. Other animals can find their way home, but not a sheep. It has poor eyes, can't see, maybe 10 or 15 yards ahead. And the Palestinian fields, if you've been to there, I've never been over there, but they say that uh, those fields were covered with narrow paths over which shepherds led their sheep to pasture. So they, the paths would lead to steep cliffs if you went the wrong way, where the sheep may wander off and fall to their death. Other paths led to dead ends, but some led to green pastures, and that's the ones the shepherd would lead them to. And still waters, you'll remember. The sheep simply follow the shepherd, sometimes over rough terrain, but always in a right path leading somewhere good. The sheep left that somewhere to the shepherd's judgment. That's what we've got to do. We've got to lead that somewhere to God and the Holy Spirit's judgment to do that. David remembered his forefathers, folks, as they were led by the, in the desert by a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. Following it, the Israelites came to the long-awaited-for promised land. So some paths are going to be hard. Have you found that out in life, folks? Now, God doesn't put a bed of roses on the battlefield, does He? He doesn't put carpet on the racetrack. 
or he doesn't promise an easy, effortless life, but he does promise us strength and guidance. He leadeth me. A lot of problem with the preachers in past years, they want to drive people. You can't do that. We've got to lead people. He, he leads us. He climbs the same hill, folks, as we go step by step. He leads us in the right paths. Isn't that wonderful? What does that scripture say? In all thy paths, what? Acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. And he'll lead us to the promised land that we're all longing for when we go to heaven. And the great promise of that. So I've probably got to finish this another time. But I just wanted to share some of this with you. Um, I thought it was interesting. You know, God just does things so right. I mean, why would he use a shepherd and sheep till you look into what goes on with all that? You know, it's amazing uh, how he provides for us and how he leads us if we'll follow. I always tell the story of the little boy scout who came home with a black eye and his little uniform torn. And his mother said, son, what happened to you? He said, I helped a little lady across the street. He said, what, why, why do you look like that? He said, she didn't want to go. <laughs> you know, people don't want to go, do they? You got to want to go to get in this kind of life, don't you? But he's promised us the opposite. He's promised us trouble. Just as he promised heaven and hell and the Holy Ghost, he's promised T-R-U-B-L-E, if that's the way you spell it. Yes, my English teacher here. But um, he said, in the world we're going to have trouble, but what? Be of good cheer. Isn't that interesting how he'll say something like that and say get happy about it? I mean, think about that. In the world you're going to have trouble, but be of good cheer. Why? Because he's overcome, and through him we can. Amen. Brother Mel, if you'll come, please. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I say it humbly, but I am brilliant. I'm like Janet, boy. She encourages her students and all by saying, if I can do it, anybody can. Somebody said, well, I can't play the piano. Well, you can too if you want to try hard enough. Oh, no. I, well, you don't want to practice, you know. But let's sing something. Brother Mac, come on. If you've got a decision you used to make, let's stand and sing. And these altars are never closed. Amen. You know, number they're always open. Number you, 452. You don't want to fall Savior's off love. of it, but come and kneel at it. All right, let's sing it. Let's, I love this love. hymn. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned and unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love. Boy, that was a great message. Amen. My, my, my. Thank you, Brother Buddy. That's just what I needed. And uh, I think all of us can say amen to that. And uh, so glad to have good people around me. And thank God for all of you. We've had a good day today. And um, I've had a busy weekend, as most of all of you know. And uh, funeral yesterday, wedding this afternoon, service this morning. And... Um, so I'm glad I got people I can lean on Amen. Uh, around here. <laughs> well, Father, thank you for your blessings upon us. Thank you for a shepherd, the wonderful good shepherd that we have through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the good message tonight. Continue to help us, dear God, to be led by you and let your Holy Spirit fill our life with fullness and all that we need 
And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.